الله ربنا هو الاله له من الاسماء ما اصطفاه الواحد الحي كذا المليك والملك المالك لا شريك اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين um i have been asked to discuss with uh, the intended who judge about the hajj medical advice for 2014 as you know the prerequisites for hajj are not only that your money is clean and your intention is very clear and you do sila raham and you clear the hukuk of people and you uh, ask for forgiveness and make your will but it is also important that you have a good health and therefore my job today is to talk about what are the aspects of good health in hajj this is the first slide here which i am showing you this is on the 3rd of zilkada in 2006 when i went for hajj with my son when he was just 14 You can see the beautiful third night of the Zilhaj the moon in the background and this is Masjid al-Shajara. This is just making you tamani to go there sooner. Inshallah. So for Hajj there are uh, things which are pre-Hajj which is what it is now which you have to undertake. And uh, number one is consulting your physician about any medical issues or problems which you might have diabetes blood pressure asthma allergies skin diseases heart problems and whatever and number 2 is vaccination and we will talk more about vaccination as we go along but suffice to mention them here is meningitis hepatitis yellow fever the flu vaccine polio and measles For those who might have heard this lecture last year, polio and measles did not feature, but now it features in this year. We will talk about it. And to have your first aid kit, to maintain cleanliness and hygiene, to have your equipment such as blood sugar or nebulizer or whatever equipment you need for your own regular use, including the asthma pumps, and of course appropriate clothing. if it is winter extra pair of warm clothes and if it is summer to dress appropriately in terms of summer and not to take very heavy jackets so um as we know these vaccines so let's talk a little bit about the diseases the why we should be vaccinated you know meningitis is a a, a serious bacterial infection which can affect the meninges of the brain and cause a condition called meningitis which can be rapidly fatal if not treated early and diagnosed the main problem is not only it is rapidly fatal but if it is not fatal it can lead a lot of residual effect including stroke and paralysis and worse than that it can actually you can be a reservoir to transmit it to your family when you are coming back or to your surrounding other people so it is important to have this vaccine and we'll talk more about it there are many viral diseases which happen during hajj and these are not very commonly understood but you find people uh, of various age groups get this but there are specific age groups like the younger children or the very old people they or those who have a lower immunity such those who have finished chemotherapy or who have taken steroids for long time or they have other conditions which will lower their immunity and therefore viral diseases easily catch them it also depends on the incubation period of viruses 
So you have various viruses, but main features are they get lymph node enlargements, they have fever, flu-like symptoms, body pain, malaise, rashes, and sometimes parotid gland swelling, rigors and chills, which are very similar to malaria. So in case of any doubt, you need to see your doctor. Common examples of viral fevers are these, which you can see in the slide. But there are viral fevers which are very serious and can be life-threatening to you at this moment or at a later stage. And the best example is hepatitis. If you contract hepatitis B, then in, it is likely, more likely that in another 15, 20 years, you might develop cancer of the liver. So don't ignore or take a, a wrong, just a rubber stamp on the yellow book and saying, let's take the vaccine on the rubber stamp without taking the real vaccine. But then if you catch hepatitis B infection, then the consequences are very bad. So you need to get vaccinated. It is usually a blood-borne disease. So if you have scratches and wounds, and another person who has hepatitis also touches you in the scratches and wounds, will transmit the disease. It can be transmitted through intimate contact, blood transfusion. Even a single drop of bl fresh blood in a swimming pool if you have a scratch or a bruise, can transmit that virus from a person who is infected. So it is very much infectious, even more infectious than, than HIV infection. Then you have yellow fever. It is very, very common to have yellow fever vaccine bought from a travel agent. You can go to any travel agent in Tanzania and get it at 5,000 shillings. And you will get the latest chap on it. It is actually amounting to almost, I don't know whether I should say that, but it's haram actually to start your hajj on a wrong footing by doing haram things. And that's also risking your life as well as the life of those who will be around you. So never do that if you are going for hajj. If you are going for real hajj, that is. If you are going for tourism, fine, no problem. You can go ahead. So it, it mimics various viral infections. It is potentially very serious illness. Its signs and symptoms are very, very similar to dengue fever. So you get very high fever, only that there is not much hemorrhage here, but there is very deep jaundice and liver failure. That's why you become yellow. That's why it is called yellow fever, because it damages the liver. And it can be rapidly fatal in 48 hours. So if you are going to take the fake book, be sure you have left your will very clearly behind. Because if it's going to be rapidly fatal, you know what's going to happen. Then there is dengue fever. Dengue fever is very serious. It usually spreads by a mosquito called Aedes aegypti. The Aedes aegypti mosquito is not commonly seen in the Middle East, but it is a very, very common um, uh, mosquito in the Southeast Asia and in Africa. And Tanzania has got that mosquito. And therefore, we are potentially um, easily infected with dengue fever. Currently, the dengue epidemic, which was supposed to be around a few months ago, is no more. It has been contained. And therefore, we are not having any fear of having dengue fever. Even if there was dengue fever, there is no vaccine and there is no treatment for it. The only treatment is to have bed rest, let the patient rest as much as possible, give paracetamol, no brufen, no diclofenac, prevent dehydration and take a lot of fluids, a lot of fluids. So if there is any signs and symptoms like that, see your doctor immediately. This will include Serious problems in dengue or yellow fever would include if there is poor output of urine, so whole day you have hardly passed water, dry mouth, dry tongue, lips, sunken eyes, listlessness, extreme lethargy and tiredness, or extremely agitated and confused, fast heartbeat of more than 100 per minute, or very cold and wet, feeling of the hands in signs of what we call as shock. If this patient is vomiting blood or bleeding from nose or gums, 
has difficulty in breathing, becomes very pale, then needs immediate hospitalization. Usually three to seven days after the onset of that kind of fever. And prevention is to prevent the mosquito bites. So in Hajj, in Tihani, because in Arafat, you may actually face huge uh, sizes of mosquito. Fortunately, those mosquitoes are not Aedes aegypti, and therefore they will not transmit yellow fever nor dengue. They are only nuisance and create a big bite. So you have to be careful about the issues on Ehram here. But it is preventable, so if you prevent the mosquito bites and if you take the yellow fever vaccine, these two major illnesses can be controllable. For yellow fever vaccine, it's valid for 10 years since you take it. But it is only effective in your body 10 days after the vaccine. If you take the vaccine today, it's not yet effective. It starts working on your body to develop the immune cells and the antibodies. It takes about 10 days. If you get your vaccine today and travel tomorrow, the Saudi government will keep you under quarantine until you finish those 10 days. So you better get yourself vaccinated now, sooner than later. Next one is poliomyelitis. Um, initially, uh, many countries have reported that polio is now no more a problem. We have been giving vaccine to children from birth and then at uh, six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, polio is almost eradicated in most of the countries in the world. But in 2003, there are about 400 cases reported worldwide, and it has become a very serious problem in Afghanistan, Nigeria, Pakistan, India, also now in Syria and Iraq. And if you see a common trend here, is that some of these areas, there is a disruption of the vaccination chain. And therefore, the wild polio virus has gone loose. And people have started getting infected with polio virus. Even Kenya has reported polio viral infection recently in 2014. So because of this issue, the Saudi government has insisted that those people who come from these countries should be vaccinated with polio, including Kenya. So if there is any of our relatives, friends, community members coming from Kenya, advise them to get real polio vaccine. It's oral drops, they have vanilla flavor, they are pink in color, there is not a jab, so don't worry, it's, it's very, very uh, easy to take, and it is given in any of the um, uh, children's clinic everywhere in Kenya. So get that one dose given to them. Because if they are infected with polio, more than 90% of them don't show any signs and symptoms. And polio virus remains in the mouth. So if you are taking in the glass of water, and then we, in a, in a very good faith, say, oh, it's okay, can I have a share of that, a sip of tea or a sip of juice? If he has the polio virus, he will then transmit to Tanzanians and you will create a problem. So one of the other thing is don't share the glasses and keep it to yourself. So polio vaccine is necessary for Kenyans. So if uh, people from uh, Mombasa, whether they are from Hajj Caravan group or um, uh, Mohamed Bayek on UJSA's group, whatever, please advise them to have the polio drops given before they go to Hajj. It is, even though it is not mandatory, but the current Saudi website indicates that those who come from Kenya must be getting the polio vaccine. So this is about polio. And then Ebola. Uh, the Ministry of Health from Saudi Arabia has banned people who come from Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Nigerian citizens. Include, Nigerian has been included only two weeks ago. They have been banned to participate in Hajj, which is rightly so, although um, um, some extreme people would say now, you know, you are encroaching upon their spiritual rights. It is no spiritual right there. It is the right of humanity to be saved from a scrooge which is potentially dangerous, and it is real. And therefore, it is rightfully that they will be barred to attend Hajj this year. 
the mustati is not only that you have the money and the leave and the permission from your employer or whatever, but it is only also that the government, the political situation allows you for safety and security to go for Hajj. So they are not mustati and therefore don't make a big fuss about them not being allowed. It is good that they are not allowed, otherwise it can be a catastrophe. Ebola is not there in Tanzania, it is not there in Kenya, and therefore you don't worry about it. Only that you be careful of those who have recently gone to those countries and if you might have to interact with them in Hajj. So keep a low profile with them. Shun them, in other words. So as I said, the danger signs of most of these viral infections are chills, rigors, neck stiffness, intense headache, vomiting, confusion and loss of consciousness. These are not common actually. In all the years of experience we have gone to Hajj, this may sound very frightening, but they are not usual. They are not usual and therefore you should not worry. But the main problems which happen is during Hajj. So these are pre-Hajj, the vaccines, what are the diseases. During Hajj, the most important things, as I have mentioned in the slide here, is watch what you eat. And uh, I, I recently read uh, uh, a surah in, in the 30th Sipara. Um, I think it is the fourth surah from Naba, and I forget. And the ayat says, uh, there is an ayat which says, and are you not watchful of what you eat? Now it may be, it is meaning about the halal food and the haram food, but um, this is not a muhkamat ayat, it is a mutashabihat ayat. Therefore, are you not watchful of what you eat, the nundus you are eating, and other things? These are not good for you. And the Quran also says in several other places that eat of what is given to you halalan wa tayyiban. And are you not grateful of those halalan and tayyiban? And therefore watch what you eat, especially during Hajj. Alhamdulillah, during the Hajj, all the groups, they provide you with a lot of food so there is no room to complain. You can have anything you want to eat at any time. Not only that, outside there are a huge number of fast food restaurants and there is a kind of a craze for it. So be careful of what you eat because that will affect you health-wise and therefore you will not be able to perform your wajibat. Drink plenty of water and fluids. Safety and security, you need to be careful about fires and fractures and traffic. So in 2000 and uh, uh, 11, there was that massive medical hoax and scare about the swine flu by people who eat swine and others. They perpetrated this medical hoax about swine flu and created a panic to all the hujaj in the world, including hujaj from Tanzania. There wasn't any swine flu. And that year, when we went to Hajj, 56 cases of fine flu were detected from antibodies indicating that they might have been infected sometime and none of them died and all of them went back home after completing their Hajj. In that year there were floods in Jidda and 750, 750 people died in the floods in Jidda. If you are escaping from death, death will come to you if you are to die. The number one cause of death during Hajj in Saudi is motor traffic accidents. So be careful about when you cross the roads. It's very, very serious. Next is to observe hygiene. To observe hygiene in all respects. So it is not, it is not good character. We are told um, that in Hajj, wala um, jidala, uh, wala fusuka, Fil Hajj. And then the ayat continues saying, and the best provision to take with you is good conduct. In ayat number 192 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And here, good conduct means you have a little cuff and you have a big kangara, the flame coming out, 
and you have a wash basin where eight of you in the room share the same basin, you make your big nice cough sound so that everybody wakes up and you spit on the basin and you don't even have the courtesy to open the tap to get it drained out. You leave the kangara there. That's not good conduct. That's bad for you and bad for all the other people who are living with you. So observe cleanliness and hygiene all the time. Even if it amounts that you wear a pair of gloves from the clinic and clean the basin for the sake of other people, do it. Because it's very important. Do not exhaust yourself. You find you spend uh, very late nights for various other things, including ibadah, for sunnat ibadah. And when it comes for wajibat, then you are exhausted and completely gone. So don't exhaust yourself, especially for females who are taking some tablets or pills to postpone their uh, um, uh, uh, the ladies' issues. And those pills cause a lot of water retention. If you exhaust yourself, carry a lot of weight and shopping, then breakthrough bleeding happens, and then all the other gotaras happen with the missiles. Refrain from smoking. Make sure your toenails are small and that your cracked feet are properly oiled and with castor oil and things right from now. Because if you have cracked feet in Medina and you go to Makkah in the state of Ehram, and if this cracked feet start bleeding, then not only your Ehram will be a problem, but you will do the Masjidul Haram will become Najis. And that is Haram because you are making it Najis. So during Hajj, keep your medicine safe. Whether nose and mouth masks, it doesn't help. The best thing is to avoid sneezing on your colleague, on your partner. So when you have to sneeze, you don't have a mask, keep your elbow and sneeze. It's no problem. For men, even in the state of Ehram, there is no problem to cover their face. The cover covering of the face is a problem with females. So they can not cover their face, but at least look down and sneeze, instead of sneezing right on the face. Be careful when you are having a shave on the head. It is a, a heroic attitude that, oh, I did my shaving on the street because I didn't want to get late. And anybody on the street can use any blood. Sharing the blades can spread hepatitis and other viruses, including HIV. And therefore, it is not a good idea. So be careful when you have a shave. Nowadays, the government has kept special barber locations and some of the hujaj groups, they have their own barbers and they have sterile blades, so you can use that facility and uh, not do some heroic activities of getting your head shaved. Now here are, the, here are four heads which have been shaved and I would like to ask, those who heard my lecture last year, don't answer it if you know the answer. I would like to ask you, you can you guess whose heads are these? They have given me permission to keep it here. It's very simple. Two heads look very similar. That's mine and my son's head. So that's Hussein Karim and myself. And on the extreme end here is Muhammad Mahdi Karim. And on this side is Hussein, uh, Hussein, uh, Hussein, uh, Hussein Datu. So the point here I wanted to drive is look, they are all sitting here and watching the dustbin where the shaved hair is being thrown. But just down below the dustbin, they are, unused, they are used blades just hanging out there. So be careful during the tenth of Zilhaj when people are shaving, there will be blades down there and you might get injured. So be careful about your walking also. This is a picture I took when I was walking in the street in Hajj, and you can see Tadkhin <coughs> Katil. It's a dead body on the other dead bodies, the cigarette. Cigarette is Katil, Tadkhin Katil. It is not allowed to smoke in public places. It is a hugukun nas, actually, because if you smoke, there are five other passive smokers, and therefore you are usurping their rights of clean air. And usurping other people's right in Hajj is even more sinful than other days, I think.
So now, um, other things which may happen is respiratory infections, such as coughs and colds, gastroenteritis. So if you um, eat unclean food, food which is not fresh, you can have uh, diarrhea. It is common uh, to have tummy ache there, so be careful about it. Uh, skin diseases, sunburn, scabies, fungal infections, sunstroke and heat exhaustion are very common. Sprains and strains. And this uh, uh, is, is very common because in the bathroom, once I finish using the soap and the little piece of soap which remains, I really didn't care, I just kept it down there instead of disposing it properly. And some other unaware guy comes inside and slips over that soap and injures himself to the extent that he requires to be stitched, several stitches or a fracture of the shoulder, or a fracture of the wrist. And this has happened, it is true, it's real. So be careful again of the bathroom because it's a common site for sprains and strains. Avoid close contact with the patients. So there is one patient who had very high fever, rigors and chills, and the doctor went to the room, fixed in a drip, and then. Now this becomes a very nice source of baraza. Now we are all going to see him, so all of us go to greet him or her in the room and everybody will be gathering there with all the montars and gunpaks and nankatais and everything there. They are having a baraza with a sick patient who has fever. So you are exposing yourself to more danger than what you would have been just by saying salam and praying for the person and going away. The hadith of the Prophet says if you are attending a sick patient, particularly if you know it is contagious, then don't stay long. Greet, meet, greet, and go. Don't stay. Wash your hands all the time. Washing hands is the cornerstone. We have a habit that we forget. Every time we pick our nose, and then we forget. Then we have a nice apple in our hand, and we start eating it up. Be careful of washing your hands all the time. Don't drink icy cold slush icy cold water. Drink cool water, you want to quench your thirst. But icy cold water or slush is not a good idea. So, um, specific precautions in this Hajj. It will be quite hot season now that it's becoming hotter. The Hajj is coming closer to June, July. So every year it becomes hotter. So you need to be very careful about doing tawaf in the peak of the noon. If you are doing a sunnah tawaf, don't be heroic. You are allowed to cover your head in the sunnah tawaf for men. So cover your head. Take the white scarf and cover the way they do in Arabia. No problem. Wear a, a cap, no problem. But you see, you toss a sana, too many uh, uh, things. If you have a sprain, stop moving, compress the affected area, keep a cool pack, and raise the limb. So, raise, immobilize, compress, and elevate. Rise. After Hajj, there are some symptoms which happen, and you'll find people when they come in Muharram, they are continuously coughing. You can notice people coming inside the majlis, and you can hear Whoever is coughing during the 10 days of Ashra, you know he's come back from Hajj. It's a chronic dry cough which remains for about six weeks. It disappears by itself, so don't keep on using antibiotics and antibiotics and antibiotics. It's not a good idea. Honey and haldi, honey and ginger would be good enough. For pre-existing conditions, as I said, make sure you take your blood sugar. It is a common habit saying that, oh, you know, the doctor is on house and he should have a blood sugar machine, and the doctor takes the blood sugar machine and the stick, and you find those five, six, seven diabetics in the group, day in, day out, every day they want a blood sugar checked because it's on the house, it's free. That's not fair, actually. Take your own blood sugar machine and monitor it yourself. Unless you find some gotara in your blood sugar readings, then you go and take the advice of the doctor. 
Don't make it a routine that 7 o'clock in the morning I want to go eat my blood sugar check because it's free on the house. That's not really a nice idea. Get your blood pressure checked now and uh, sorted it out. For those who have very close veins, sitting for too long is not a very good idea. So you have to be ambulant, you have to walk all the time. Particularly ladies who have very close veins. Uh, get your blood slide checked before you leave, about one or two days before you travel, and then get it treated or take the medicine. If you are positive but you don't have fever, no other signs and symptoms, but you, are, you have malaria positive, all malaria positive should not be treated because all of us, if we go to do a malaria test, at least 20 of us will have a blood slide positive. Because we live in a malaria area, we have malaria parasites in our body. But that doesn't mean we are suffering from malaria. Only if the signs and symptoms appear, then you have to take the medicine. So if you check it's positive, keep, keep in mind, take the dawa with you. In a couple of days, if you find the symptoms, then take the dawa. Then you don't need to check again. So if you have a problem, any problem, what do you do? If you have a problem, if you think it is not a normal thing, you know this is not my common, then go and visit the doctor. Adhere to the doctor's advice and stick to the announced clinic timings. It's very important for your health and for the physician's health. If the physician is healthy, then all of you will be healthy. For ladies, you need to be careful about these ladies' issues and consult before you travel. I'm going to finish very soon. So um, this is a slide where it shows uh, um, the websites which are showing the common, the normal requirements for Hajj this year. It is updated annually, so the most updated uh, website information is available in this one. I have extracted from this, so most of the vaccine things I have said about is already spoken, but you can visit these websites until 18th of August, the latest has been updated. So uh, you should not uh, worry about what you know already. Now coming to the vaccination schedules. Hepatitis B are three doses. Hepatitis B, ideally in the routine setup, there should be three doses. If you take hepatitis B today, ideally, if you take vaccine today, you should repeat after one month and then repeat after five months. So totally in six months, you have used three doses. That's the ideal routine hepatitis B schedule. But what we say in Gujarati, jare uthe, tyare sawar. So if you have realized now that you have not taken hepatitis B and five months is too long, then you can use a schedule course called the fast track. So you can use one now and the second dose after two weeks. Two doses are sufficient to protect you, and when you come back, take it after five months. That you will be covered. Okay? So if you have not taken hepatitis B, you take it today, I mean tomorrow or day after, and take it after two weeks before you travel. And then when you come back, make sure you take after five months, that you will have cleared. A yellow fever, minimum 10 days before travel. Meningitis, again, minimum 10 days, but ideally four weeks before you travel. And meningitis is only one dose. It is valid for three years. Make sure you have the ACWY-135 vaccine. There are others which are bivalent and others which are four, four different types. ACWY-135. This is available at Aga Khan, and the same administrator from Aga Khan, who is also the administrator of Ibrahim Haji, has made it possible to have it at Ibrahim Haji. And these are well protected in the cold chain 
so they are reliable. There are many centers. Now that it's a big business, there are many centers, but they are not authorized by the government to give those vaccines. And you are not sure of the cold chain and the procurement. If you are sure, if you are confident, no problem. I have no qualms about it. But you must have SCWY 135. Polio drops, as I said, for Kenyans. So let them know. Measles for children under 15 who are going for Hajj. And in some countries, um, Saudi government requires measles vaccine. The flu vaccine, the swine vaccine, is optional for a specific age group. Above 65 years, below 15 years, immunosuppressed people, those who have had chemotherapy and are taking steroids or something, then the specific groups. Some countries make it a requirement, like Americans and North Americans, Canadians, they must have a flu vaccine before they travel. But for us, it is optional. Then there is a, a tablet called ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin is given to you on entry. It also prevents the carriage of meningitis. The meningitis bacteria can be inside the nose. So the government there gives one tablet to all of us. Don't be brave enough to say, 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 ciprofloxacin. Unless you are allergic to it, or for females, if she is pregnant, then she shouldn't take it. But take it. Ciprofloxacin is protective. So don't show bravery there. There is no heroic, uh, any, any martyrdom in getting meningitis with your own hands. Even on exit, sometimes they give. Sometimes the cafe doctors will give on, on the day of travel. They'll give you one dose of ciprofloxacin, all of us. Lastly, the timings of the clinics are there on the wall and the elevators and other areas, usually. They are accessible at various gatherings, the doctors, for minor questions or clarifications. Emergencies are handled swiftly, so don't panic. And do not help others with the medications which you have. I've carried a big kit for it myself. My doctor, Ungyoto Dr. Karim Pase, Manekido, Kedaidia, Hoito, Akao, Akao, Akao. I will too be kaile ne aj. It's not right. One man's meat is another man's poison. And when you go to the clinic, please knock the door. It has been very embarrassing several times that the doctor is examining a patient and then you just barge in like that. In the Surah Nur, there is an ayat which says, before you enter anybody's room or house, please knock. Knock three times. If you don't get a response three times, go away. Don't wait. In conclusion, good health ensures a good hajj. Make sure your vaccinations are clear. All ibadah should be planned and should have a purpose. And therefore, keep your purpose in mind. And therefore, hajj is no exception. Thank you for listening.